one of my lower division classes yesterday, I had embed papers, and I usually go over just all of this kind of stuff. But I kind of decided to expand quite a bit. Not because the papers were quote unquote bad. They weren't. I don't even think, if memory serves, I think the lowest grades in here were C minus, which for my classes, that's, you know, if you uh, looked at reviews on, you know, rate your professor, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's some honest stuff and there's some dishonest stuff there, but I'm known for, you know, being pretty hard in, in the grading. So uh, there were a couple of A's. One, I really debated whether or not I should read the paper to you because it is the epitome of an A paper. It is... It is so far head and shoulders above everything else. In fact, I wrote on this student's paper, it's probably one of the best student essay exam, exams I've read in over 25 years of teaching. I mean, it is, it's doctoral level writing. It is that good, okay? So, we're gonna go over this. I'm gonna, you know, in, in some of this, gonna point you back to what the exam actually stated and such. So let's go over the easy parts First, the proofreading abbreviations and symbols. And most of you probably already know what all of these are if you can read them. Um, but I'll you know, get on my soapbox every now and then. Spelling. Okay, one, most of you are English majors. Those of you who aren't English majors are probably English minors. And if you're not an English major and English minor, you're weird for being in this class. Yeah, I just <laughs> have to admit that. But this is an upper division college course Spelling is part of the territory. If you can't spell, learn. Okay. If you can't learn, leave. I'll just be boldly honest with you. Okay. Especially when it comes to characters' names that you're writing about. Okay. But you don't. In the Wanderer and the Seafarer, you don't have any characters' names. You just have Wanderer and Seafarer. Dream of the Rouge, you don't have any characters' names, so the only one you're left with really was Beowulf or Bede. And I understand there's a lot of funny spelled names in Beowulf, okay? But if you're going to write about Beowulf, spell it B-E-O-W-L-F. Nobody misspelled Beowulf. I'm just using this as, as an example. Don't spell it Beowulf, B-A-Y-O-W-U-L-F. I have had a student do that before. Threw out a paper, spelled it that way. He did that intentionally because the title of his paper was something like, Gale. yeah, it was Gay Wolf the Gay Dane or something like that. So he was changing the name of the play on it. It was just a horrible paper. Okay, spell things correctly. Spell authors' names correctly. Okay, comma splice. Everybody know what that is? Let me see a show of these. Here's why. I never heard of a comma splice until I got in graduate school. I don't know if the term had not been invented. If it had, none of my professors had ever used it to describe my writing. Okay? What do you do with a comma splice? I mean, what is a comma splice? It's kind, of. kind of. That's badly that's, where is it? That's this. Is where you try to put two independent clauses together with a comma. Bingo. How that was. You're splicing. Any of you are in recording industry management, minors, or whatever, you maybe will have to splice tape, but I know that dates me more than it does <laughs> that. You're splicing together two independent clauses. I went to the store, comma, I bought a gallon of milk. Independent clauses. So how do you fix the comma? Comma and a conjunction. Or a comma and a conjunction. I went to the store, comma, and I bought a gallon of milk. Okay? Or I went to the store, semicolon, I bought a gallon of milk. Or I went to the store, period, I bought a gallon of milk. Okay? So there's a bunch of ways to fix it. Fragment, sentence fragment. It's not a complete sentence. A complete sentence is a complete idea. It has to have a subject, it has to have a verb. You know, Jesus cried, one of the shortest, easiest sentences, for example, in the Bible. Subject, verb. Usually, where students make errors here is they, they have a sentence, they end it, 
And then they begin the next sentence with some kind of participle, like meaning that. Well, the meaning that tells you everything that comes after meaning that is what? what what's the purpose of that clause? It's to <laughs> modify something that came before it. It's a participial phrase. Okay? So you fix that by putting a comma at the end of the one sentence, meaning that, and that fixes it. Or it might be you accidentally left out, you know, like is. Why? Because it's an hour before class is due and you're frantically <laughs> typing away and your brain is moving a hell of a lot faster than your fingers are, right? And you don't give yourself time to proofread, etc. Okay? Agreement. All kinds of possibilities for agreement errors. There's one area that um, these have become much more common in about the last 20 years, right? And there's maybe a handful of professors in the English department, full-time professors in the English department, who pay any attention to this anymore. And it's when you say, um, something like, uh, I won't write it down. The fee, the fee, sir. The seafarer, the poem, um, suggests that a person should look to the Lord because they are going to die. A person gets replaced with what later in that sentence? They. A person is what? Singular. Singular. They is always plural. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Why? It, it's screwed up thinking. It's not logical. Okay? You want your papers to be, this isn't poetry right? you want your papers to be logical and clear. Right? So, why has that become more of a problem, let's say, in the last 20 years, than it was when I started in this profession, or than it was when I was in your shoes. Because, like, you're supposed to say his or her instead of his for the inclusive, but then his or her sounds kind of clunky, so it just makes more sense. And we don't really in English have, like, a gender-neutral, like... You know, we don't have a gender-neutral pronoun. A gender-neutral species, yes. Okay. But that refers to, like, a person, because, like, it doesn't work, obviously. I used to joke. Maybe I should go back to it. I tell my, when I teach cop this, you know, because I talk about gender use of language very, very briefly. And I say, here's one way to get over it. Just include a little bit of everything. She, he, it. <laughs> now, obviously, it's meant to be facetious. Why? What, you know, it's shit of the mind. In other words, get Again, horrible, bad thought. Okay, So how do you get over, or how do you get around gendered use of language? If that is an important issue to you, I'll admit it, it's not to me. Okay? Bingo. Use one. The seafarer, the poet of the seafarer, says that one should dot, 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 because they... No, because one is one, and they is plural again. Okay? So if you're going to use one, use it throughout. All right? You can't say one, dot, 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 she. Why not? She is singular. Ah, there's another case of agreement, though. Gender agreement. This is neutral. This is not. See, pronouns and adjectives in the English language, and you can tell you this because he's studying history of the Germanic languages, must agree okay, with the nouns they modify or represent in case, number, and gender. Case, the part of speech they are. Okay, 
You don't use him and then later on who. Different case. You gotta do it him whom. Okay? If I were to say these kind of errors, that is a grammatical inconsistency. It is a grammatical agreement error. These, what's the next word need to be? Kinds, plural. Similarly, you wouldn't say this kinds. That just sounds wrong, right? Well, that's because there's something in your mind, a generative grammar thing that says, crash and burn, okay? So, agreement's pretty important. Subject-verb agreement, very important. Here's where the, most students, if they make a subject-verb agreement error, it's because they have a compound subject. Um, the search for gold and the love for treasure is one of the central problems in the Wanderer. No. The search for gold, that's the first part of the subject. The love of treasure, that's the second part of the subject. It's a plural subject. It's a compound subject. So what kind of verb is it? It needs a plural. R, one of the, and how do you know it really needs to be R? Because when you then later on in that sentence had one of the problems, say that problems is what? It's a nominative complement. It is restating kind of the duality or the plurality of the subject, okay? Apostrophes, where do we use apostrophes in the English language? Two instances. Louder? Possession. Possession. What else? Contractions. And contractions. Do we ever use it for plurals? No. no. I was reading an article, I don't remember where it was, New York Times or something. That wasn't the New York Times because it was talking about poets. <laughs> New York Times doesn't know what a poet is. And it did this. And it was plural. And I thought, okay, not can maybe give the writer a little bit of slack. Because this was published somewhere, it might have been on a website. The editor should have called. <laughs> the editor should have been fired <laughs> for that kind of boneheaded error. Okay? <clears throat> so, apostrophe errors. Usually, it's because you don't have one. You said, this is possessive. And you got the poets. <clears throat> right? uh, wrong word. That means the word you've chosen doesn't fit. The context is all wrong. It often happens with something like this. Form and from. Two perfectly good, acceptable words in English language. You're writing along. You're thinking from. Your fingers type form. You're relying on that amazing intellect called Microsoft Spell Checker. They're both perfectly acceptable words in the English language. Spell checkers do not check for context. Unless they start putting lots in, you know, IBM supercomputer in them, uh, which they haven't. It will catch automatically all the time that T-E-H, because that's not a word. In the English language, okay? So, wrong word means in your sentence, the word you've chosen, it just is wrong. It doesn't work. Word choice means in the approximately 2.4 or so million words in the English language, there's a bad one out there. <laughs> this is entirely stylistic. Word choice. Wrong word means it doesn't make sense, okay? Awkward. Your sentence is like a four-cylinder car running on three, maybe two cylinders. In other words, it's not running very far. Okay? It's, it's, I can get the gist of the idea, but it's not clear. And it's often tied to ambiguous. If you're taking you know, Dr. Brewer's poetry writing class, you want a lot of this. You want your poems, I mean, well, if we ever get to any of them, uh, you're going to see, you know, if we get to Shakespeare's sonnets, 
Shakespeare is the master of ambiguity. You can read the poem one way, or you can read it almost the complete opposite. Okay? These papers, no ambiguity. Everything should be literally black and white. It should be so utterly clear, it's like I go, well, why did I ever do that? Okay? Um, v with a period just means very, but it's usually in front of awkward or ambiguous. Okay? Punctuation, you left one out, or there's an error in your punctuation. Few sentences, you've joined together two independent clauses without any mark of punctuation and or conjunction. This simply means insert whatever is below it, and it's probably a period, a semicolon, a colon, a comma, because words I usually write above, um, like this. Put the word above it where that thing is, okay? This is for mark of, marks of punctuation. This is almost always for an apostrophe or a quotation mark, okay? A line with a curly Q kind of thing through it, get rid of it. It might be a word, it might be a letter, it might be a couple of letters on the end of a word where you've accidentally made a verb singular and it should be plural, and it's clear to me it was an accident, okay? Underline, put it in italics. For example, Beowulf, the title of the poem, goes in italics. Why? Because it's a really long poem. Okay. The Wanderer and the Seafarer go in quotation marks. Why? Because they're not really long poems. Really long meaning roughly 200 lines or longer. Okay. Um, three lines under something mean capitalized. You know, first letter of every sentence. You're not going to eat Cummings. You don't get the freedom that E.E. E. Cummings have. Okay? When you become E.E. E. Cummings, or, you know, Bailey Hilliard, the professional, then you can, you know, punctuate, write, spell, have every one. Until then, capitalize. And I'm not picking on Bailey. I don't think she has this at all. Circle means there's a problem. You figure it out. Okay? Probably it's going to be spelling or an apostrophe. I don't circle, you know, things like sentence fragments because that would be circling the whole sentence, okay? Um, huh? Well, it's kind of, you know, this, but um, I don't understand. It means I really don't understand. If, if there are three question marks, it's straight, either straight over my head, you are, you are so much more genius than I am, and believe me, that is extremely easy because doesn't take much. Or you've been very awkward and ambiguous, and it's unclear. And how would that mean? You'll, you're writing in Swahili. And I just don't have an idea what you're getting at. Okay? That's all this basic stuff. Anybody have any questions about it? Because this all I, this part all I'd be fairly clear. This other stuff I've decided um, to do for a couple of reasons. Again. And it's not because your papers were horrible. The majority of the papers were C's. There were several B's, and I think there were two, maybe three A's, which isn't a bad breakdown, actually. But I've started to notice something over the last several years. And because I've started to notice that, I've decided when I request my teaching preferences for next spring, and hopefully someone will smack me and put me in my right mind, I'm going to offer to teach two sections of comp, uh, which I don't normally do. And here's why. A lot of the writing that I've been seeing, and not just undergraduate, graduate level too, has been vague and fuzzy. Which is, fuzzy's nice if we're talking about a pillow or a blanket. Not when you're talking about this kind of writing. Okay? You want this kind of writing to be clear. So, go over this for a moment. For whatever essay you're writing for an English course, unless your professor tells you the exact opposite, one, always include a title. Why? What's the purpose of the title? To draw the reader in. To draw the reader in. Think of the title as, come on, come on. This, I don't know if you can see it well. It's a map. 
Okay? If I were to put in directions up here, what would it show me first, whether it's Google Maps or Apple Maps? It shows me the big picture. Then what can I ask it to do? Specify. Give me the turn-by-turn -turn directions. Okay? Title, big picture. Therefore, what should the title do? And not, flip that around, say something that is not addressed at all in the paper. I've literally had papers, not in this class. I've literally had papers, for example, um, topic two. Tolkien in his essay, Beowulf the Monsters and the Critics, says that all Anglo-Saxon literature is about the death of man and all his works. And so the title is something like the death of man and all his works in Anglo-Saxon literature. And then the paper goes on to talk about the use and hoarding of gold. I, I would have the exact same reaction Christina just had. Huh? <laughs> you know, the old RCA Victor dog. Huh? There's a problem here. That map doesn't give me the right directions. Okay? So I would probably write something nasty. Not nasty, but something mean on the top. Because every now and then, my inner Gestapo <laughs> will come out. And I apologize, but, well, I kind of do. <laughs> so, what else must it include? A works added page. Why? Not just because I'm a hard ass English professor. Why else? Plagiarism. Plagiarism, first of all. Credentials is bloody name. And also, just like so other people can like look at what you looked at. Okay. And all true. Like, like, You're missing something. I mean, the most obvious part. What does this tell you? Works cited. That you've actually read it. No, not that Even more basic than that. You cited it. That is, in the paper, for example, in the paper there will be Joseph Black, the Broadview Anthology of English Literature, British Literature. Or in the paper there will be Beowulf. Translated by Roy Luza, etc. Well, why is that important? If you're writing about Beowulf. So people know which translation you're Okay, using. that tells me what translation? More basic. What translation you cited. Okay, more basic. You're writing about Beowulf. Why are you citing Beowulf within your paper? No, more basic. More basic. <laughs> step outside the English classroom, step into a courtroom. Louder. It's evidence. Your, the material you cite, that is your saying. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce Exhibit A. Beowulf lines, whatever. And then. Exhibit B, C, D, E, however many it takes. Read a scholarly article, and many of them, you know, if it's a 20 page article, will have how many citations? Scores! Some of them, literally hundreds. Why? What is the author, or what are the authors of that article showing you? One, some of you said it. I've read the material. In other words, this isn't just BS. I don't know. You can BS citations. Yeah, you can BS citations. I would recommend you not do it <laughs> for the simple reason I have looked at site. You know, I'll get a student and I'm kind of, and I'll pull it up. And it's not there. And that's automatic F. That's not 55 points F. That's zero. You lie to me, all grace is gone, you know, straight to hell. Okay, so what else? This is being, your English majors, you're governed by MLA. MLA says parenthetical citation, or your English minors. Okay, parenthetical, so we don't use Chicago, we don't use APA, we use MLA. And you know, as many problems as I have with the MLA, one, both as an organization, Two, it's political stance. And three, the utter 
moronicity <laughs> of their actions in the last two years by going back in time to a style that was employed when I started college in 1980. Oh, no, yeah. For example, using PP before the numbers to indicate what is the Oh, yeah, that is real ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it's so ugly and clunky. That is like right? having to do the whole web address. And yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, they brought back, you have to like type in the whole like URL. Utterly. <laughs> Okay, so use parenthetical citation. So what does this mean? Come over here for a second. Okay, actually, no, we'll skip that for a moment. Okay, introduce quotations and paraphrases. What does that mean, introduce? Here is my quotation, cola. Okay, <laughs> if that's the best you can come up with as an English major, you might want to work on that a little bit. But it does mean not ending a sentence with a period and the very next thing being a quotation mark, quotation, in quotation mark, parentheses, period. Why? Because when you do that, those quotations just kind of float. It's like they exist in and of them. They don't exist in and of themselves. Why are they there? Because you are commenting on them. You are working that quotation into your idea. That's why the wanderer says, you've just given me an introductory tag. Quotations, that's easy. Why? Well, what does a quotation begin with? Quotation marks. Paraphrases. Paraphrases have, must be introduced. You can't simply end a paraphrase with the citation. Why not? Andrew, you used the word earlier in reference to work cited. You could be guilty of plagiarism if all you do is indicate where the paraphrase ends. Why? You've given me a citation. You've showed that it's borrowed. But what haven't you done? Bingo. You haven't shown the reader, a.k.a. me, where your idea stops and where you're borrowing from somebody else. If I can't tell where you're borrowing from somebody else, then yeah, strictly, literally speaking, you're guilty of intellectual theft. Because that other person's words might be interpreted as being yours. I've had, again, not in this class, I've had a paper before, not even at this university, Paper before, it was a joint graduate, undergraduate level course. I had a student write a paper, and literally every paragraph, and this was like a 15-page paper, every paragraph ended with a citation. And I just kept writing. So this is all borrowed from. And my final comment was, so none of this is yours. The entire thing is paraphrased. Okay, so where are your ideas? Uh, what kind of grade do you think that got? Not a good one. Okay. You have to indicate where that paraphrase begins with some kind of introductory tag. So and so suggests. Okay. If you looked, I don't know that anybody did. I don't know that there's a thing that allows me to see what kind of usage it gets. Um, that's weird. If you looked um, <laughs> under the content tab in D2L, I've got a little document there called Sherman's Guide to Successful Papers. It gives you a bunch of suggestions for how to work in both paraphrases and quotations. You could, you know, just steal that if you want and use those exact same phrases. Um, there are handbooks, like the old Harbrace handbook, has a page that lists like 100 really good introductory um, verbs you can use, okay? So, all that. Now we're getting to the real meat. Craft a powerful, strongly worded thesis. First topic. No, not the first topic. Fifth topic. Discuss the theme of impermanence, the transitory nature of everything under my under the sun in old English literature. So, a very weak thesis is 
The wanderer, the seafarer, and the dream of the rude are about the impermanence of life in this world. Why is that a very weak thesis? Because it doesn't really tell you how they're about. Okay, it doesn't tell me how they're about that. What else? It's, it's too broad. What else? It's even more basic than that. You're not even like making a claim word on here. Bingo! That statement, the wanderer, the dream of the rude, and the seafarer, are about the imper impermanence of human life. That's a statement of fact. Nobody can read those three poems and go, no, that's not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Okay. You never want to state the obvious. So if you're not stating the obvious, what are you stating in that thesis? You use the term. It's something that's arguable. Okay. I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Something that is arguable. Passive. That's passive tense. Or passive voice. No. You want it to be active. You want that thesis to metaphorically reach out, grab me by the collar, slap me across the face, and say, look, stupid. This is a really good thesis. I'm going to argue a point. Think of the, your thesis. Sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. Think of your thesis as Donald Trump. Is anybody ever unsure of what Donald Trump thinks about something? Yeah, because like he'll say one thing sometimes, and then say like, but then he'll say something else. That. Okay, I agree with that. But go back to the first thing. He'll say something. That something is not usually wishy-washy, right? I mean, it's usually. I mean, it's usually something crazy, but it's something you know very clear. Your thesis needs to be clear. It needs to be strong. It needs to be forceful. It needs to be powerful. It always, always includes some kind of opinion or judgment or evaluative comment. Okay? That's the argument part. It's an argument. Every person in here has been in an argument, right? How many of you gotten into just a drop dead kick you know what argument where you and the other person almost came to blows or you're no longer friends with that person. Okay? When you got into that kind of argument, was it, well, if you really think that way, that's okay. No. No, it's, you know, you're willing to die on this hill, you know. And this hill might be which is better, Coke or Pepsi, you know. Right? So that thesis has got to be really strong. Why? Some of you, I put the comment, what's the purpose of the thesis? Think architecture. Think construction. It's the foundation. It, it's the foundation. Well, if the foundation of a house is weak, what's going to happen to the house when the big winds come? It'll collapse. Collapses. What's going to happen to the foundation of your argument when the big wind, me, <laughs> comes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay? And I have had papers where I've, you know, had two or three pages. Now, this is an essay exam. It's relatively short. It's not a term paper. But I've gone through entire pages and done this too. Drawn a line with the circle. Just get rid of it. Why? I will say, not relevant. It, it doesn't fit your argument. Okay? I did that with a couple of, I think, these papers with two or three sentences, all right? So, you, you get done with this, all right? Where does this come? First paragraph. first paragraph. Where in the first paragraph? Either at the beginning or end. I would suggest putting it at the end. Why? Because the end of each paragraph, this is just something wrapped in our minds. That's what we remember. It's like when you're talking to somebody or making an argument, you save your best points for the last because, I mean, those are going to be the zingers that you use, all right? So if you think of it that way, that first paragraph builds to the thesis. What's that first paragraph serving as? It's kind of an expansion of this. It's giving you the big overview. It's telling your reader, essentially, here in a nutshell, in brief, is the entire paper shrunk down to a nice little manageable size. So what do you then do in the rest of the paper? Your first paragraph after the introductory paragraph. 
topic sentence. What does every sentence in that first paragraph then do after the topic sentence? It goes back to it. It supports it. It builds upon it. What's the purpose of a topic sentence? It introduces the main idea for that paragraph. Do you want to introduce another main idea within that paragraph? Nope, because I'm going to put this right there. That means new paragraph. I've literally gotten papers. I got one the other day, sophomore level. I think the student's a senior. Gave it back. Three-page, four-page paper, one paragraph. The whole thing. And I was like, not a paper, not an essay. This is a brain dump. Okay? This is merely blah, 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 getting it all out there. And then, you know, maybe rearrange a little bit. But it's not a succession of ideas. Each one building upon the other, and each topic sentence doing what? Going back to supporting the thesis. So each paragraph supports the thesis, so that when you finally get to, huh, I guess we're over here now. <laughs> yeah, when you finally get to over here, the conclusion, what are you left to do? Tie all those loose threads together. Bring all the paragraphs together, okay? Brings all the elements, paragraphs together, recapitulates the thesis, don't copy and paste the exact same sentence, because I'll write off to the side, redundant. Don't tell me what you've already told me. Rephrase it. Okay? And never, and I've, I've seen this especially a lot, almost more so with graduate students than I have with undergraduates. <laughs> oh, no idea in that concluding paragraph. Don't do that. <laughs> because what that tells me is, one, you've not gone through and revised. If you've got a new idea at the very end, why didn't you go back and work that idea earlier into the paper? And that new idea kind of says, look, a bunny. To me. Okay. Well, I don't want to look at the bunny now. I wanted to look at the bunny earlier because I want to bring the bunny into the comments that I make about it. All right? So, body paragraphs, topic sentences, one main idea, all the others support and build upon the topic sentence, each paragraph then concludes, has kind of a conclusion statement and a transition to lead me to the next sentence, the next paragraph, and then that does it. Does a essay have to have five paragraphs? No! One of the lies from the pit of hell taught in high school English, okay? <laughs> or it has to have three, no. Be different. Give me eight. <laughs> or six, or nine, or 10, or 12, or 20, or, you know, it doesn't matter. It all depends upon the length of the paper. 1,100 word essay, you don't have a lot of room there. You know, which is also, go back for a second to the quotations. You don't want a 15 line quotation from a poem. Because 15 line quotation, you're talking close to 150 lines. Oh, that's over one tenth, just right there, okay? So you have to be judicious in your choice of quotations and such. So let's go over this for just a second. Quotations. Format. Okay? When you're quoting a relatively short passage, what does that mean? If it's verse or drama, that's three lines or less. Okay? If it's prose, you know, you're in an American lit course and you're quoting, I don't know, Declaration of Independence, or, or uh, Franklin's autobiography. If it is more than four full typed lines, that is, it takes up a total of four lines, okay, or less, okay, you work that into your sentence. So, Franklin writes, comma, quotation mark, and you give the quotation. All right. If it's poetry, you give the quotation and you, or, or um, a play, you give the quotation and you indicate where each line ends. How? Space, that's what the number mark means. Space, slash, 
space. You don't have the last letter of the previous word right up next to the space. Some of you did. Okay. So space slash space. If it's more than three lines of verse or drama, or more than four full type lines of prose, you indent from the left margin. I think I did I say there. Yeah. You indent two tabs. Usually it's a half inch or an inch. Okay. It should not line up with the first line indentation of a paragraph. It should be in one more from that. Okay. You indent from that left hand margin and print it exactly as it appears in your original. Okay. You don't indent any over here. I've got stuff that's, you know, back when I was stupid and I had page length requirements, I'd have students give really long quotations of prose and they'd indent like two inches over here. Because that makes, you know, a quotation that might be this long, this long. It makes it easier to get to the page length. Okay. Um, so that's what that is. Work cited. And this is where I hate the new MLA. You can do the work cited a couple of different ways. And I don't care if you don't use the modern 8th edition. If you go back to the 7th or the 6th edition, that's fine. Believe me, my old brain likes that better. Because I bought the new edition, I've got it on my Kindle, I just haven't sat down with a big bottle of scotch to read it yet. Because <laughs> that's what I'll need to get through it. So, say you're, you're including Beowulf. Now, I've got Beowulf first, translator second. Could I put Leuza's name first? Yes, I could. I could have Leuza, comma, R period, M period, or Roy, space, M period, comma, translator. That could come before, okay? But I'm emphasizing the Beowulf aspect and not the translator aspect. So, do that. Then the title of the anthology that it's in, with a comma at the end, not a period, Concise edition, all lowercase, volume A, that V is a lowercase, the A is capitalized, comma, edited by Joseph A. Black, one or two of you, I can't remember how many exactly, listed all the editors. Well, there's like eight or nine. That's why the Latin's invented et al. <laughs> et al means, it's an abbreviation for et alias, and all the others. Sucks to be one of the others. I was an assistant textual editor on a, an edition of a 17th century English poet, and I was one of the others, you know, because I wasn't the main or general editor. And then you have, after, edited by Joseph A. Black, et al., period, comma, name of the publisher. Notice, no place of publication anymore, okay? Date of publication, 2017. And then, a couple of you did not do this, the inclusive pagination, that is, all the pages in the book that Beowulf falls on. And you can include only the text of Beowulf there, or you can include the text and the introduction. Okay? If you're citing the introduction that Leuza writes to Beowulf, you then need another entry just for the introduction. Similarly, if you're citing the introduction written by Black et al. You have to have a separate entry for that. So it would be Black, comma, Joseph A, period, comma, uh, uh, period, introduction to the Middle Ages or whatever the title is. And then you'd have all of this stuff. Okay. Now, notice, if you're writing about four or five different things, in our textbook, say you're going, going to look at, let me pick a real broad topic, love in British literature, nice and broad, and you're going to refer to eight different sources, then that means you've got all of this information eight different times. And if you're stupid like I am, that means you probably typed it all out rather than copying and pasting it. Well, there's an easier way to do that, cross-referencing. So put one entry. I ran out of space. Like this up here. Black, Joseph A, period, sim, uh, comma, et al, period, comma, EDS, 
period. Okay. They're the editors. Then you put Broadview Anthology of English Literature, comma, concise edition, comma, volume A, comma, Broadview 2017. That is a separate entry. Right? Then all your other entries, Shakespeare, William, period, sonnet 18, quotation, uh, period, in quotation mark, in black, page number. And that's all you have to do. That tells your reader, go back to this and find that page number in that book. And it's right there. They started this, I think, with the sixth edition of the MLA handbook. Really, you know, for, especially for people writing dissertations, really made it a lot easier, okay? When you're referring to something a multiple number of times, or you're writing a you know, major term paper, honors thesis, or something like that. All right? Any questions about any of this? I don't want to go on until I'm sure. None? Okay. I didn't think we'd finish all that in the amount of time we had. Let's see. So it's uh, 1035. We have 30 minutes. Okay. So we are so far behind um, in grading these. It took a lot longer. I spent a lot more time on these than I normally would. I spent about the same amount of time on these as I would on a regular term uh, paper. And what that means is, with few exceptions, these took on average anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour each to grade. Because, I mean, and if you can't understand my scribble, it's because I'm writing so small, trying to fit so much stuff in there, so much information in there. Uh, the, uh, the few exceptions are the really, really, there were two really, really, really good papers, and that pretty much took five minutes. Um, didn't have much to say there. Um, or, and it wasn't the case this time, but it wasn't the case with this class, really, really, really bad papers. I mean, I have literally gotten a paper before, done that along the bottom of the first page, and then wrote, I stopped. F. Just because, you know, every third word is misspelled, or every sentence is a sentence fragment. I mean, I've literally gotten stuff like that before. Um, but I didn't have that um, problem. But I spent a lot more time, one, because you've got a paper coming up in about two weeks, okay? Which is giving me my other problem. We need to have an exam over the Middle English stuff, and I'm, how do I do this without running into that paper? Um, so probably what I'm going to do is, I think my temperature's back because I'm burning up. Um, today's Thursday, right? I'm probably going to try today. Take that back. I won't try today. I'll do it today. I will post an exam just over the three Middle English things we did with probably clearer, more simply expressed topics. Okay? And have it due next Thursday. I know. It'll be pressure. And I'll, you know, lower my... I won't lower my expectations much, but I'll, I'll lower them a little bit by, I hope, making it clearer. Or making my um, my topics clear because we we've, we've got to get that done. I had actually thought of using if we met on Tuesday, using today, just to have an in-class exam. But because you have no idea what to expect from an in-class exam, um, I didn't want to do that. So I'll probably do that, which means we can go ahead and start. I don't even need that book. Um, the Renaissance. So, all we're pretty much going to do today is, should I do that or should I just jump in? Tell you what, I'm going to put a video lecture up. I'm going to give you a link to kind of my standard background of the Renaissance and 17th century pitch. Um, and I'll just have you watch that at your, 
at your leisure. That way we can jump into Shakespeare. And then now less than 30 minutes that we have. So Shakespeare. And I apologize for the couple of you who are in my Shakespeare class because you're going to hear some of this all over again. Birth and death things. April 23rd, 1564 is the date commonly attributed to Shakespeare's birth. Why commonly attributed? We don't have his birth certificate. Yes, they did have birth certificates then. We don't have his. Right? We have his baptismal certificate, but it doesn't specify the date he was born. But based upon the baptismal certificate, Shakespeare scholars have suggested April 23rd is probably about the right time. And they also choose it for another good reason. Because he dies on April 23rd, 1616. Right? So, how old was he when he died? Younger than I am. 52. Okay? 52. And in that 52 years, let, yeah, let's for a moment, let's, you know, play Fantasy Island. In that 52 years, he writes 37 full plays, 154 sonnets, and four long poems. Now, I know. He's not writing these plays when he's one year old. So when does he start writing these plays? We're not exactly sure. Okay? He's born to a Catholic family in the Midlands, 64, as we said, uh, November... Uh, April 23rd is also St. George's Day. St. George and the Dragon. St. George is the patron saint of England. Kind of fitting, right? The patron writer of England, the greatest writer in the English language. Some, myself included, the greatest writer in any language. Okay, Born on, on his country's patronal feast day. It just, you know, has a nice cosmic ring to it, right? He gets married in, come on, thing, um, 1582. He's 18. Anybody know, old, know how old Anne Hathaway, not the modern, yeah. the original, Anne Hathaway was? 26. She was eight years older than him. I'm not saying there's anything bad with that. She was eight years older, with him, older than Shakespeare. They get married. Six months later, she has her eldest child. Okay, now there is something to that. They did not get married in Stratford. They got married outside Stratford, outside Warwickshire, the shire that they lived in, probably because she was pregnant at the time of the marriage. Um, a six-month preemie probably would not have lasted in Shakespeare's time, right? So the first child is born February of 83, and the other two, the twins are born, I don't remember the month, but in 85. This is Susanna, and these are Hamnet and Judith, okay? And then... And then from 1585 to 92, those are collectively called, by some, by many, the lost years. Why? After 1585, we have no documentary evidence of Shakespeare for seven years. We don't know what he's doing. There have been lots of theories, and some of them going back to within 100 years of Shakespeare's death, in fact, even closer to that, within 50 years of Shakespeare's death, of what he was doing. One speculation was that he was a headmaster of school. 
Another speculation was that he traveled the continent. <clears throat> he took a quote unquote gap year, but it was seven gap years. Keep in mind, wife and kids back at home. Um, another idea was that he was a traveling actor, traveling throughout the provinces of the shires and such of England. No proof for any of them. We have no evidence that Shakespeare ever took a university degree, which would kind of be what would be required to be a headmaster. Okay. Uh, another idea was that he was a tutor. Again, no proof. We don't even have actual physical evidence that Shakespeare attended the local grammar school in Stratford, the King Edward VI school. Though, if you go to the King Edward VI school, um, when was this? Four, no, five years ago, when I was in London with my family and teaching my course, we went to Stratford, and it's the only time I've been there where they've had the King Edward VI school open for visitors. They do it for like one week during the summer. We got there just on the right day. So we could go in and, you know, each of my kids sat down and sat where anecdotal evidence says this is where Shakespeare sat, etc. You know, the youngest, of course, went and sat up in the headmaster's seat, so rule over everybody. Um, but, you know, went into the dormitories, the rooms, etc., etc. It's all pretty cool. But we have no evidence that Shakespeare actually attended there. He's not in any list of the roles. It's assumed he did because his father had been mayor of the town. So, you know, yeah, there's connections. Okay? But again, no evidence of any higher education. So where did he learn Latin and Greek? Because we know he knew Latin and Greek. Some of his sources were only available in Latin and Greek. It would have been at the King Edward VI grammar school that he would have learned that. If Shakespeare started there at roughly the age of five or six and left at roughly the age of 11 or 12, he would have learned as much Latin in that five or six year period or six or seven year period. He would have learned as much Latin upon leaving there as a modern university student majoring in classics would know after getting a university degree. So, like an undergraduate? yes, so like a student who studies classics at Sewanee, which has a very good classics program, that student would have as much Latin after four years at Sewanee as Shakespeare would have had as about a 12-year-old. Part of that's how it, was, how it was taught. You know, you start off early, etc., but by the time the kid is 11 or 12 in their last year, you know, you're given a copy of... Caesar's Gallic Wars in Latin. And you're told, translate this page. So you translate that page onto your slate, okay, write it all out. The headmaster or the, the master of the class looks at it and it's got to be perfect. And if it's not, you know, wrap on the knuckles kind of thing. Okay, that's the first part of the translation exercise. Have you ever done this in any of your German stuff? Here's the real kicker. You then take your translation into English without the original, and you translate it back into Latin, and it has to match it perfectly. Okay. That's how you learn mastery of a language. That's to where you start dreaming in that language. Okay. Shakespeare apparently did this because he had a pretty good command of Latin. Not, as we'll see when we get to Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson's level. But Ben Johnson's level would have been like a doctoral student's command of Latin. I mean, he, he knew Latin and Greek inside and out. So when he says Shakespeare had little Latin and less Greek, he's saying, compared to me, Ben Johnson, he's got little Latin and less Greek. Okay? Anyway, we know in 92 he's in London. Why? Because another writer alludes to him. Thomas Green, I think it's Thomas Green, in his little pamphlet publication, A Groat's Worth of Wit, that's the abbreviated title, your introduction talks about a greater length, and a million more of repentance or something like that. And Green laments the rise of what are called the university wits, okay, of which he is one, let me rephrase that. 
Green laments for the university wits the rise of certain authors who haven't jumped through the proper hoops, who haven't come through the ranks, come through the university. Okay? And one of them in particular, he says, I think this is in your introduction. Talks about a certain shake scene from the country. Okay, I'm not seeing it, so I'll have to find it. He he refers talks about a player's hide wrapped a uh, player's something wrapped in a tiger's hide, which is a couplet taken from Shakespeare. Okay. So he uses this line to talk about this upstart crow who has feathered himself with our feathers, essentially. Okay? This is telling us that in 1592, Shakespeare's already made a name for himself. He's already bothering the professional authors. This would be like, you know, the literary intelligentsia of the day. Okay? It's pretty clear most Shakespeare scholars will say, that some of Shakespeare's plays have been written prior to, the eight, prior to 92, possibly as late as 89. Okay. There are some references to plays about certain topics that we think these topics are Shakespeare's. But we know in 92, his plays are being produced because we have records of them. And then we have records, essentially, throughout the 90s. People going to plays and they mention plays by Shakespeare. If you saw Shakespeare in Love, Jeffrey Rush's character, Philip Henslow, Henslow was a producer of plays, competing playhouse, Admiral's Men, but he also was a prolific journaler. It's partly through him that we know about plays that no longer survive because he talks about I saw such and such. I saw such and such. I saw such and such. His is one, Francis Mears, uh, another character. Francis Mears is another uh, guy. Sorry, no apostrophe. Don't use apostrophes for her. Um, is another one. And he actually gives us lists of plays that he sees in certain years. That tells us not the exact date of authorship of some of Shakespeare's plays, but the dates by which the plays had to have been written because he saw them in performance. All right? Now, we're obviously not doing any of Shakespeare's plays. We're doing the sonnets. So when did he start the sonnets? We don't exactly know. He could have been writing you know, the sonnets back here. Could have been. We don't know. It's assumed he probably begins them in the mid-1590s for a couple of reasons. One, we have a reference to Shakespeare's sugared sonnets in the mid-1590s. Okay? That's a pretty good reason to assume at least some of them are begun by then. Um, another one is because in the mid-1590s, the playhouses are all shut because of plague. You can't have big conglomerations of people. And it is assumed that Shakespeare probably spends some of his time writing the sonnets, okay, as well as probably writing some other plays. Now, the interesting thing about the sonnets, and your textbook doesn't mention this really very much. I mean, it does a little bit in the introduction on 84 and 85. We don't know who the sonnets are written to or for or about. Each of those three might be the same person, might not. Might be one person, might be two persons, might be three people. Okay. When the sonnets are first published as a group, we don't know that Shakespeare has anything to do with the actual publishing of it. Okay. Same goes with the publication of each of the plays. We don't know that Shakespeare personally has anything to do with it. We don't know if Shakespeare had a manuscript of, I don't know, King Lear, and he takes it over to the printer to have the printer publish it. 
We have very, very few documents in Shakespeare's own handwriting. We do have some copies of plays where Shakespeare has made changes to them. We have copies of plays by other authors where Shakespeare has, you know, helped them out in a pinch and written a scene or a few lines. And we have Shakespeare's, we know this is Shakespeare's, by the way, because we have his handwriting in um, six copies of his signature. Three different wills where he spells, spells his name three different ways. This is one of the pieces of evidence that a group that is called collectively the anti Stratfordians uses to say William Shakespeare of Stratford upon Avon is not the William Shakespeare who wrote the plays and sonnets. If you saw the film Anonymous, that's what it's all about. Okay? And the anti Stratfordians have very big names among their supporters George Bernard Shaw, not a slouch by any means. Did not think Shakespeare wrote the plays attributed to him. He thought somebody else did. Okay. Um, the guy who won, um, not this year, last year, Oscar for Best Actor, I think it was Best Actor, last year, Mark Rylance, okay. doesn't think Shakespeare was Shakespeare. It's a big deal. He's just another Hollywood actor, right? No, he's not. He was the first artistic director of the rebuilt Globe Theater from 1995 to 2005. Uh, take that back. Yeah. It's either 95 to 2005 or 97 to 2007. And is, you know, as a director, is, I think, one of the greatest interpreters of Shakespeare who's probably lived. I saw multiple plays that Rylands both directed and starred in probably one of the greatest Shakespearean actors of our day. I mean, he is he's a hell of a lot better than Lawrence Olivier ever was. <laughs> if, you've, if you've seen Olivier, at least in film version, okay? I mean, heads and shoulders above. Um, just get, get the Globe version of um, Twelfth Night, which is a reprise done in 2012, which is a reprise of the production they did in 2002, which my wife and I saw, the original one. Christopher, um, tall guy, Harry Potter reading. Christopher Fry plays Malvolio in it. Um, in the original in 2002, um, Eddie Redmayne played the role of Viola slash Cesario. Yeah. Um, before he was Eddie Redmayne, he was just a nobody then. Um, and it, it, it's just hilarious, but Mark Rylance as Olivia, the Countess, just steals everything away. It's done in Elizabethan fashion, all men. Okay. Um, he doesn't think Shakespeare wrote the plays. I think he's completely crazy, but I'm not him. <laughs> so we get the sonnets. The sonnets are addressed within them to two people. Okay. You have the speaker of the sonnets who may or may not be William Shakespeare. Don't assume it is William Shakespeare. Okay. But the speaker of the sonnets addresses two people, never by name. One, I'm going to use abbreviations, the golden-haired youth, a young man, long, blonde, curly hair, kind of like the knight's son in Canterbury Tales. Okay? And the other, the dark lady. Dark meaning black. Okay? Not just tan, black. All right? So the speaker addresses these two. For the most part, sonnets one through... 126, I believe. Actually, I don't think 126 is in here. Yeah, 1 through 126 are addressed to the golden haired youth, and 127 through 54 
are addressed to or about the dark-haired lady. 1 through 126, addressed to or about the golden-haired youth. Okay? So, the golden-haired youth is of a higher social status than the speaker of the poems. The speaker is acknowledging, I'm not your rank. The dark lady, we're not told. But it's highly unlikely that the dark lady would be of a higher social status for the simple reason she's dark. Okay. Probably Moorish, North African, like Egyptian, Algerian, something like that. Okay. So why is he addressing these two groups of people? Well, for the most part, and especially in the first 20 or so of the sonnets, what's the speaker telling the golden-haired youth to do? But remember, look at the very first sonnet, very first line, page 886. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. We want beautiful people to reproduce. Why? So that the world will have beautiful people. What's the flip side of that? We want ugly people. Yeah, we want ugly people to die. Let just let that gene, gene pool, you know, go away. Okay? The first 20 sonnets or so are telling the golden-haired youth, again, pick your famous, you know, beautiful, blonde-haired young man or youngish man. Go. Spread your seed. Have children. Reproduce. The speaker is not saying, I want to be your lover. How do I know that? Look at Sonnet 20 with the five minutes we have left. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted, hast thou the master mistress of my passion. Okay. So nature painted you with a woman's face. And you are the master mistress of my passion. You're the controlling force of my passion. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. Is the speaker saying that all women are false? Maybe. The speaker might be saying, all women, guys, they're going to cheat on you. Okay? Long history of that idea in English literature. But the speaker might be saying... This person doesn't have a heart like false women do. Not that all women are false. Meaning shifting, changing from, oh, look, there's Fred. Oh, there's Tom. Oh. And I'm more bright than theirs, less false in rolling. Rolling meaning shifting her gaze from this person to this person to this person. I mean, think about this for a moment. If you had... I'll use names some of you used before. If you had Gerard Butler, if you had Chris Hemsworth, if you had the other Hemsworth, if you had Tom Hiddleston in here, ladies, what would your eyes probably be doing? Bing, bing, bing. You'd be bouncing back and forth. More than likely, okay? That's what he's talking about. Gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. Why does her eyesight, or false women's eyes, gild the object whereupon they gazeth? This will blow your mind. Because in the Renaissance and medieval times, it was thought our eyes shot out beams of light. That's how we see. <laughs> the only problem with that, of course, is you don't see beams of light bouncing on her head, right? Okay? Well, they're invisible beams of light. But when they gaze upon someone, they do what? They gild. They, like, put that person in a nimbus or a halo. I mean... Just beautiful language. No matter what he means, it's just glorious. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling. A man in hue, in appearance, all hues in his controlling. That is, when he comes into a room, all other appearances, all other faces do what? <laughs> Even the men go, not fair. You know, which steals men's eyes. And women's souls amazeth. And for a woman wert thou first created, that is, 
to be a woman. You are supposed to be a woman. Till nature as she wrought thee, nature sitting here putting body parts on, you know, smoothing out, you know, fell a doting and by addition me of thee defeated. She added something to you and that something she added to you defeated me. By adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. What's the nothing? That's his, the speaker's purpose. I wanted the nothing in you, but no. She had to go and put something there. But since she, and then shake her, you know, little wink and nod to his audience, prick has the same meaning in Renaissance times. But since she pricked thee out, gave you a prick for women's pleasure, mine be thy love. It's the love, it's not sexual. It's platonic love. It's a love of the mind. Mine be thy love and thy love's use because love that exists only up here is all platonic, right? In order for it to leave Plato's realm of ideas and get down here in our world, what else must it do? It has to be realized through it. Exactly. It's got to leave up here and come down through here. Okay. It's got to be physically expressed. We're going to see John Donne do the exact same thing in one of his poems. Okay. So this poem's telling us what? The speaker is saying, this is not a homoerotic affair, even though a lot of critics want to read it that way. If it were, he wouldn't say, you know, damn, nature screwed me over. Not literally. She, because if it were homoerotic, you go, no problem. I can deal with that. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Oh, one more class. If you have questions about your paper, um,